We're joined now by the historian Elizabeth Hinton. She's an associate professor of history and African American studies at Yale University and professor of law at Yale Law School. Her new book is America on Fire: The Untold History of Police Violence and Black Rebellion Since the 1960s. She's also author of From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime. Professor Hinton, welcome to Democracy Now. It's great to have you with us. And, Professor Hinton, I wanted to ask you, your book tries to put what is happening now in the historical context, because obviously many of the young people uh, uh, who are participating in these protests don't uh, know much, a lot of the history. And what I think struck me was that you went not only into the period of the 1960s and, and 70s, which was crucial, but even further back, pointing to uh, some of the— uh, civil disturbances and rebellions that had occurred in prior uh, decades. Uh, uh, I've always been particularly struck by the impact of of world wars, both World War One and World War II, on racial unrest in the United States, and how the returning soldiers often then were not as willing to— uh, black and Latino soldiers were not as willing to accept injustice. Could you talk about the, the early teens of the 20th century and and the, this historic conflict between uh, black communities and the uh, white establishment. Right. That's such an important part of our history that I think we fail to recognize. And that's that for, for most of the 20th century, the majority of uh, collective violence was inflicted by white mobs against communities of color and especially black communities, very much in the context of migrations stimulated by, as you said, Juan, the, the First and Second World War. So you know, beginning in Springfield in 1908, but then also in East St. Louis in, in 1917. Uh, basically, white residents in East St. Louis attacked black war wartime fa factory workers in one of the bloodiest race riots of the 20th century, forcing black families to choose between being shot to death or burned alive. And then, of course, the red summer of 1919, as you mentioned, uh, with returning GIs who had fought for democracy abroad, returning GIs of color, w wanting to stake a claim for citizenship and saying, OK, we fought for democracy abroad. Now let's 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 realize democracy at home. Uh, when faced with continued segregation and white vigilante terror and violence, we saw the outbreak not only of uh, of racial strife in the streets of, Amer of American cities like Chicago and Washington, D.C., but also the continued attacks by white vigilante forces on black communities. And then, of course, we're coming up um, next week on the 100-year commemoration of the Tulsa massacre, where uh, thousands of white men who were deputized by the county government uh, destroyed, completely destroyed the thriving Greenwood community in Tulsa. And, and these examples of white vigilante terror, and, and let me also emphasize, deeply entwined with law enforcement. I mean, law enforcement was complacent in many of these uh, episodes and many of these massacres and attacks on black communities turned a blind eye or actively participated in the violence. And then, of course, during, during and after World War II, uh, the, the kind of the race riots that we saw after World War I, uh, literally street fights between black and white residents in places like Detroit, where uh, federal troops had to be called, persisted. And I think what's really important about this back history and, and this history of white collective violence is that it was only in the 1960s when black, when black people rose up against repressive and exploitative institutions, that these incidents of collective violence became labeled as criminal and as riots.